What is knowledge? Hi, I'm John. Welcome to Philosopher's Corner. What is knowledge? Knowledge, for starters, it's one of the basic building blocks of philosophy. And so to try to define it in traditional, orthodox, philosophical, academic ways is very, very important and also very precise discussion. To which end, like, nobody's really come to a sufficient answer, like, spoiler alert. <laughs> uh, but, you know, knowledge is this idea of, you know, we go, oh, I know something. Oh, I know the sky is blue. I know a cat when I see a cat. I know that two plus two equals four. And a whole host of other things. And there's also, I know that something is such and such. Right, to have knowledge of something that's not your, you know, direct participation in. I know that something, right? I know of something. There's all these different types of knowledge. And so what is it? Right? What are we get like what are we exploring here? What are we saying when we say we know something? So we kind of begin with like, well, there's different types of knowledge where the information comes in, right? I, I say begin with the idea operating that knowledge is the acknowledgement of perspectives internally. In this case, we're talking from a, a thinking human being. That knowledge is the acknowledgement in, in the brain and to the mind and soul of a perspective of something keeping in mind that perspective of something applies to ideas as much as it applies to things in the real world. So it covers from abstract to concrete, from potential to realized, you know, potential to kinetic. Perspectives cover all levels and all spectrum of knowledge. To me, all knowledge feeds into perspective, and then perspective is what we get internally. And that perspective can be very precise and very like in the world, and it can also go up to all the abstracts, to the limit, to the limits of the formation of thought, and, and then even to the knowledge of the things that precede thought and precede formed. We can have knowledge of that, right? And that's a perspective being registered in our human body, which then in turn informs our soul and consciousness, but we'll get to that. So knowledge to me is this, uh, it's an acknowledged perspective gained through different means. And so now we, it's helpful and crucial to sort of talk about what are the different means of obtaining this knowledge. Uh, so one, we have what philosophers refer to as innate knowledge, which is like, you just know something in you and for some reason you trust yourself and you just know innate knowledge things that you just know then you have things that are gained through observation you know that's what a lot especially our early lives are spent doing like toddlers and babies and stuff you just go around and go oh I'm in this world time to go observe a bunch of stuff and start creating a catalog of things that I know. That's a dog, that's a cat, that's a table, uh, that's food. You can eat food, you can pet a dog, don't switch the two up, you know? Like, and you go around and you observe all these different things and you start building this categorization in your mind of all these things that you know. You know, at the same time that you're gaining this fundamental cataloging of the objects and items and things in your world in an early age, you also start getting associated abstract ideas through education or discussion or through acquaintance, right? So now we're engaging multiple types of knowledge acquisition in that time frame, right? We have observational, where we're going around, we're seeing things, we're meeting things 
get an education and people are telling you things. They're sharing, they're sharing knowledge from other people that's been condensed and through language, it's the knowledge is purportedly being transferred to you through pure vibration, by the way. Talking, seeing, being in the room as people, doing stuff, that's all, it's all vibration. It's all nearly via osmosis, like conscious osmosis of transfer of information, which is purported to be knowledge. Now saying that something's knowledge does not speak to the truth or falsehood of the thing. Someone, I mean, a con artist can tell, he can give you knowledge of something, but that knowledge is a scheme that's designed to benefit him and he can conceal that. And so, you know, you can know things that are not true. So it's not a test of if something's true or not, but knowing it is having the perspective absorbed into you and then having it access for you to be able to use because knowledge has many applications. So there's innate knowledge where you can know something, you can just know something. Probably a lot of our instincts, I would say, are sort of built into our DNA and during certain development ages, the body basically unlocks or activates the, basically programming, so we can have an innate knowledge of certain things just to boot us up, which, whatever, that goes to the design of the human body, which is amazing. Then we have observational knowledge, which means we're, we're seeing things and we're pairing it up. Uh, we have a, like a knowledge by acquaintance, which is basically teachers and, and people we know, or things that you know we have relationships with where some information has been transferred to us. And we go, oh, I know that guy. Well, when you say I know that person, what are you really saying? You're saying I've communicated with that person, or I've spent time with them enough to that their information of themselves, I'm familiar with it. I have knowledge, I know, right? Emotional, intellectual, all kinds of senses, doesn't matter. That's really what we're saying. Now, to me, there's also, with innate knowledge, there's also knowledge that can be gained through meditation and essentially you know I guess you call it spontaneous knowledge but it's really just knowledge from higher realms that we're bringing in to self and I think that's this is a fair moment in human evolution to bring that into orthodox philosophy is that so many people and really all thinking is a form of meditation it's just like a more intellectually pre-guided form of meditation, so to say, but when you get in more free-form thinking, meditation is really just free-form reception of thinking, like, and bringing it in, and there's just millennia worth of documented people who can just sit and pull in new information out of the blue, basically, and have knowledge of something new, and then give it to people, and then move forward. I mean, Einstein did that, that's what he did. Um, but, so there's that type of knowledge as well, which, you call it spontaneous knowledge, or channel knowledge, or whatever basically you just meditate and you get new knowledge in and then you use it or give it to the world or whatever but that's a totally valid form of knowledge that's been it's repli it's you can replicate it and it's been done globally by every sort of human in every sort of situation so there's that type of knowledge um, that's type that's a type of knowledge that you know spiritual institutions certainly lean heavily on and they document and they champion that they go hey you know these people they figure some stuff out by using different sensory perception organs essentially and tapped into pure spiritual energies and informations and knowledge it all comes down to knowledge because the knowledge are these you know these bit these bits of perspectives that as we go through and we incorporate them which is another way like we, what it happens with the collection of knowledge. Well, we really build self with the collection of knowledge. you know. And then there is knowledge of self, which essentially every single tradition of higher thinking and higher perspective attainment, attainment, they come back to the same conclusion that the highest form of knowledge is knowledge of self. And they universally report back that 
all is contained within self. So know thyself is the most important knowledge wisdom. And that goes back to the innate knowledge. Well, where does innate knowledge come from? Well, if, if everything's within ourselves, then and knowing ourselves is knowing all, well, then everything's innate knowledge, right? And then that sort of gets the knowledge momentum going. Okay, because some people get obsessed with collecting knowledge or, be, or know, you know, being knowledgeable, or they get into knowing, and uh, which is fine, unless you get obsessed with it like anything else. Because knowledge is a knowledge in and of itself is just okay. It's nice, but it's the application of knowledge, right? Because I think knowledge, because knowledge. When you, find, when you get through it and you combine it with wisdom, like knowledge and wisdom and a few other things, then you start to reach the heights of awareness and consciousness can get activated. You know, that, we'll talk about that in another video. But knowledge are like the bricks. It's like a brick of acknowledged perspective. And sort of, it's kind of like a jig, like it doesn't have to be like this. I mean, it can be like whatever metaphor you want, but to me it's a little bit like, I don't know, you're building, if, if in this allegory we're building ourselves with these foundational materials that we're getting through self-awareness called knowledge, then at some point, like, you built yourself. And then, and then once you built yourself, then you go do other stuff, you know, because you fashion yourself out of knowledge, so to say. And then you can use it in the world. And the knowledge that you gain through the process of gaining these knowledges, it also informs you about the world and the rules of this particular world, how things operate, whatever, all the particulars to the, because, you know, you could have been born on a different planet with different physics involved, so the knowledge in a different incarnation would be different than it is on Earth. It's particular to the planet you're built in, you know, to, this, to the planet you're on, to the species you're born into, to the area of the planet you're in, your topography, your socioeconomic class, all the knowledges, they're different. Until you get enough knowledge is to start building big data trends and then you can start seeing the universal principles at play. Then it doesn't matter. And that's always, you know, if you, if you get aware enough, you'll transcend whatever culture you're born into. It doesn't mean you lose it, but, you know, you'll rise above and, and see higher levels of things. Just, you know, when you look around, you'll see other people who did the same thing. They popped out of their culture and you're like, oh, hey, that's cool. You did that too. Like, yeah, figure things out. How do you figure things out? Knowledge. So you do that. I remember, uh, yeah, my first year at West Point is famously known as plebe year, where they strip us of all of our <laughs> normal operating abilities. You can't speak unless spoken to. You have to walk around at detention, out in public areas. Any of the upperclassmen can stop you. Uh, it's all kinds of stuff. And you only get, I forget what it was, like six, five responses, unless they ask you for more. And one of the things you're responsible for is knowledge. So you have a knowledge book, which is essentially helpful trivia about West Point. And then there's daily knowledge. Like you have to know the, you have to read all the, you have to scan the newspapers, know all the articles on the front page and sports page. You gotta know all the food menu items for the day. And there's like a few other things you gotta know. Uh, and you're liable for it. When you're walking around, people are gonna stop you and ask you any of those things. And that's called knowing, that's, that's your knowledge. And plebe year, you know, it sounds weird at first to do that, but it holds you accountable. It gets you in a rhythm of information. And then it sets like rules for the game for self-esteem. Cause when people stop you at first, it's a put on, you're like, Oh, this is weird. Oh, he's going to stop me and ask me about this thing. Oh, okay. And you don't know what it is. So you're a little terrified cause they have power over you. Um, but once you do it for a few months, it becomes, it becomes good. It becomes a way for people to have conversations with you. It cuts through the power structure you get comfortable with the fact that you can update your uh, knowledge daily and that knowledge is a perishable thing and it's also a refreshing thing. So there's all these other aspects that once you just get into the routine of being held accountable for knowing something, some things that are permanent and some things that are more transient, and you can hold both in your mind. You can hold long-term truths or long-term, excuse me, long-term knowledge in your head along with sort of daily and even hourly changing knowledge that's also a type of knowledge in and of itself because then you have knowledge that there are different types of knowledge and you learn to trust so a lot of when you start taking knowledge simply just to to know something either innately observationally through experience through study 
through osmosis. Then you can start really playing around with things. And it'll play around with you basically. You don't have to do anything. It'll unfold because there'll be such an attainment that it'll start to form bigger perspectives and bigger pictures and show you more. Then you'll start to see truth. Like when you have enough knowledges, even if some of them are 100% accurate or whatever, if you get like enough knowledges together in a certain area and you concentrate on it, then you'll start to see a bigger picture. Even if some of the knowledges aren't great, you know, they're whatever. Cause you'll have enough, cause most of the time you're gonna know that it's true or not. Like I say, it doesn't, it's not, it doesn't tell you if it's true, but like when you learn to discern truth in coordination with the knowledge breaks, then like you'll have a pretty good pack of, of truth. And you'll know that you have a lot of truth knowledge together when you don't have to break it down mentally anymore. You'll just look around, you'll just, you'll just be seeing what's going on with clarity. When you can achieve clarity, clarity uh, is achieved through a tremendous amount of knowledge being absorbed. And you can do it in any of these different ways. You know, you can spend 50 years and, you know, studying books, take, take kind of a slow route or, you know, you can study a little bit, do a lot of meditation. Meditation is a biohack in that way. You can gain so much time's worth of information in such a low amount of time. It's like a zip file from the universe. That, that's why a lot of us yogis do so well. And then, yeah, you combine it with going out and doing things and you get you get a nice mix. And really, that's what life is. When you look at it, you, can't, you really can't avoid that. Because even if you don't think you're a meditator or whatever, you dream. I mean, you dream, dream's just a, involuntary meditation every night <laughs> it's like here you go your battery ran out go meditate on that like oh but it's sleeping yeah it's also medicine dreams are just dreams are just weird things that happen while i sleep yeah i mean personally produce meditations by yourself in the universe so usually providing you some type of knowledge i mean some of your best knowledge will be in your dreams that's another way to know right look at all these great ways to know i mean arguably life is just about knowing because when we say experience, like when Jimi Hendrix asks, are you experienced? He's really saying, did you intellectually know the observational thing you did? Did those come together? Did you get, did you observe and participate in enough things and then have knowledge about it, have awareness about it, where it unlocked it into going, yeah, are you experienced? It's the same as saying like, are you knowledgeable? Except he kind of cuts to the chase a little more with that phrasing. So yeah, knowledge it is the basic building block for really getting to the deep end when, you, when philosophy starts becoming really real and you realize, oh, this is actually a useful guide for life. Wow. Um, and there's many ways to obtain knowledge. And, you know, really at the end of knowledge, because we're talking about collecting vibra vibratory evidence from our reality using our, all of our senses in all the ways that we can interact with reality and sending them back to our vibration decoder, which is our brain, and it sends it into all the different regions of it to figure it out, which does what really? It really just informs our soul. I mean, it goes to our mind first, which is kind of an ethereal thing that scientists can't figure out. So it goes from the brain to the mind, and then really from there to the heart and soul and everything, and then really up to our consciousness, because our consciousness, our consciousness is really kind of what's above our soul. Our soul is kind of like our compiler between us, our buffer, compiler, interpreter between us and our consciousness. So the, the body seems to be a process of distilling knowledge and perspective into a soul compatible format that then gets put into our consciousness. And we'll talk about consciousness another time and where all that goes or theoretically goes or whatever. But to me, that ends up being why knowledge is a necessary part of sort of the spiritual nutrition of life and why we, why we have a hunger for it, almost like Pac-Man eating little pellets. Knowing things and knowledge, it's when we scan back and forth in the human timeline, it seems to be the driving factor in the experience. As much as, pe as, much as we wanna say all these different things, whether describe different experiences of knowledge, like love and joy and drama and comedy and tragedy and hope and rage and like all these things right really all those things are just categorized on our knowledge because those are just 
lenses that we're putting over interactive knowledge. And that knowledge, when distilled, eventually con ends up constituting who we are. So in a way, it's pretty amazing that we're human beings and we have something like philosophy where we can go in and self-scan and determine these things for ourselves, kind of calibrate ourselves. Oh, what is knowledge? What is truth? What are my values? What are my ethics? My morals? Like da 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 da. We can really set ourselves up so that our interacting with the reality is sending is using the reality for the purpose it's meant to be used for, which is an experience that enriches our soul and our consciousness. And we can take control of it and program ourselves with the use of philosophy. And, you, and philosophy is compatible with whatever, if you have an overriding spiritual belief or whatever, philosophy is compatible with that. You can use philosophy to constitute yourself in accordance with what your higher principles are. It's a tool and it's a tool that's available to everybody. So knowledge, it's that important. It's sort of the, it's sort of the motivator of life for beings like us. You know, I won't speak, I won't speak to the uh, reptilian experience or the porpoise experience or, uh, you know, what the birds are up to. But from a human perspective, <laughs> knowledge seems to be the motivator. It's, it, it, it informs us, it refreshes us. It's really the experience that we're talking about, even when we're speaking emotionally or intellectually. It all just comes down to knowledge and we take it in and it informs us and builds our soul and goes into our consciousness, which by all accounts is timeless and eternal. So knowledge might be the word we use for catalyzing the temporal realm into our eternal selves. All right, well, thanks for spending some time here on Philosopher's Corner with me, John. Uh, I hope you had a great one.